Uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about um, uh, what happened, you know, what we were talking about this morning, what happened in Bath, um, was it happening elsewhere, how did it affect what was happening elsewhere. Um, and also, I mean, we did touch on it this morning, uh, the, the present day street art, street theatre. Um, but if we could bring this afternoon, if we could bring it up to the modern day, uh, you know, we're starting in the 70s and just how it developed up into the, um, in, into the present day. But particularly if we start at the beginning, um, how what was happening in Bath, how it was reflected elsewhere, was, was it a source of influence here or was, was it a general zeitgeist that was happening worldwide? Um, John is going to start just uh, an introductory yeah. uh, thing, so let me introduce um, um, John. Hi, yeah, my name's John Lee. Um, I was um, I was late to the party actually. I, I didn't turn up really until the late 70s, 78, 79. Um, and I'd come down from London where I'd kind of been working in Portobello Road and uh, in the politics of North Kensington at that particular time. I knew Tom Costello who's here. Um, Tom. And um, uh, it was it was kind of, for me, um, I, I follow another kind of tradition. So um, in the sense that my work I, I, I was here, I was working, for example, in Abbey Courtyard, being a busker, and I'd been working, I, I'd come from that tradition more of uh, Jacques Lecoq and, um, and, um, um, and making contact with the audience in a particular way that was kind of different from um, the, the uh, artwork that, um, uh, the traditions that came out of the art schools, which I think this tended more to do, um, being more influenced by um, the John, John Fox tradition, the, you know, the, I've written down a few things like the the, the whole area of, of Dada, Surrealism, Capro. The, that tradition was much more. But the minute I say that, I, I kind of think, oh, it sounds too intellectual. Actually, what I really enjoyed was the actual experience of being at the festivals. And what I learned most was at that particular time was to actually come without any ideas to any things that, that were being put on and, and engaged with. I was part of the, the, the Albion Fairs in East Anglia, I remember very well as, as the ones here, where you would turn up and people would just literally get together and decide, hey, what are we gonna do? Yeah. What are we gonna do? Uh, someone's got a white horse, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> some, someone's gonna come here and run over the hill with 10 people, someone's gonna rush around the corner here. And you'd sit and you'd work out a show. And that was an extraordinary experience for somebody who had kind of only engaged with the process quite late in life and it was just kind of just learning a little bit about how to how to work an audience how to improvise how to change what was usually a very fixed kind of relationship with an audience where you went on you either juggled or you did something and then you had this relationship with somebody and, and then you had a show and then you finished it off and it was a very regulated kind of circle that, watching etc but I do want to stand up for that tradition as well I think that's an important tradition and it fused with lots of other things and John was talking earlier about the way that that thing about making eye contact with somebody knowing somebody really well really quickly um, um, and then uh, in Bath I went up to Covent Garden and then it, because it became because I went silent from a a usual rapping, talking show, busking show, I suddenly found that I was booked uh, kind of national, internationally around, around the world and worked for the various organisations. And that took me a, a long way away from what was going on. So I feel a bit of a sort of cheat being here in a sense, because I don't necessarily belong to that tradition, but I think it's an important tradition to talk about, primarily because of what it offered in terms of the courage to improvise, the courage to, to change, the, the ability to, to move things um, to the, the ability to 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 to, to adapt um, and, and to dare to do to do things, and that's that's what I got largely out of the tradition of uh, of the festivals here in particular. Um, so and Footsbarn and Incubus were big in, big influences for the work that I was doing, um, being at festivals and watching Footsbarn, open air. Under the moonlight was kind of key moments in in terms of the way that worked. Can you use the microphone? How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. And and Incubus, and out of Incubus came a, a company that I worked with called Skullduggery, which was a sort of a strange little duo of mad beggars that were outrageous, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm sort of just stating that down in a particular way. But I think one of the the questions that come back this afternoon that I think we're looking at. Um, 
um, is, is was, was it radical what was happening at that particular time and, and what's happened to that radicalism if it was radical and, and what, what is radical now has, has from this morning's suggestions um, that whole area gone has, have we lost everything in terms of the commercialization, the commodification, all those different elements that now, you know, risk assessment, all these various points that were being mentioned. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of not going to do more than just introduce that question, but I would like people to say what was radical at that particular time from the floor? What, was, what, were, you, what were you doing that was radical? And then if we see what actually has emerged, because I then took into <coughs> quite a lot of European practice, what has emerged, because you've got to remember that many of the things that were happening here influenced the French outdoor arts mm -hmm. sector, which then took off with massive funding that allowed people within that semi-protected state of being state funded to experiment and explore. And in some ways it is said, leave us leave us behind a bit in terms of that structure. And I think that's an important development in the way we talk about radicalism because there's an awful lot of work that is very, very exciting, very challenging that actually continued to happen in different parts of the world that was influenced by what happened here. But we've got to remember that that, that was funded and that was supported hugely. Okay, and that, that makes a huge difference to, to allow you not to have to be a busker to have to make a living, to make contact, to make eye contact, just to keep an attention in order that you can get paid. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, potentially a very conservative kind of, of, of theatre happened that was in the tradition I talked about. Um, so I'm going to pass over to, 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 to yourself, first of all, if that's possible, around, mm -hmm. around, the, around that theme of what was radical at that particular time, because I know you were really very much part of that, and you were in that tradition halfway between those worlds. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. I guess. Um, I guess. And and so, and 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 open to the floor. What you know? What was radical that was happening at that particular time? Because assumed it was. But I'd like to know more about that. Questions. I've got an idea. Thank you. Is that so much of it was so pointless? <laughs> it was so beautifully pointless, yeah. and kind of like you, you kind of. Can we reduce it? Can you be sophisticated but dumb? Can you kind of fulfil all these paradoxes of it's complex but it's simple, it's nothing but it's everything, um, it's, it's artful but it's not particularly saying anything. And, um, and in a way that's a kind of, uh, I think at the time, if you want to give it a bit more of a sort of post-war context, um, that was a sort of re a gentle revolution. You know, you sort of, what are you going to do next? What's your career going to be? Well, I'm going to stand in the street with a piece of string and follow it around. And the kind of that, the beautiful aspect of nothingness. So that, that's hard to keep going. <laughs> Um, and it's ha it's actually hard to do because it, in a way, it's very sort of existential. And some of the things that um, I was thinking as I watched the film is that some of it is quite clearly very entertaining and very amusing, and that's satisfying and fulfilling as a performer, and that you've got it. And clearly, some of the the work there. Uh, were people finding out about what's, what happens if I do this? I, I don't quite know yet, but I'm going to try it. And some of the work is, is not funny, it just isn't amusing, but they're doing it and finding out what that is like. And I found that some of the most kind of provocative work in how far can you just do unfunny, pointless things in the street before it somehow just doesn't work anymore? We've, You've got to stop it somehow. Okay, so to just come back to the question was what might have been different or unusual at the time, I think it was a big experiment in um, nothingness or everythingness. 
Um, so I'm um, funny and pointless. Um, this is what was radical: uh, the fact that you could create images that were that weren't, in fact, part of a structure. Because even though in those festivals, a lot of the people didn't know there was a festival. So what they did is they experienced the work that was under its umbrella. Um, but uh, yeah, but the unfunny and pointless, um, I think, is a good is a good thing. Um, Rick, did so you I'm want to speak? turning my phone off because he's, oh, he's turning his phone off. Um, unfunny and pointless. Um, uh, when I first worked with the Natural Theatre Company, which is in 1974, I didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and I relate quite strongly to what Mitch was saying about Exploded Eye, who were already uh, at work in Bath at the time with Roland. Um, and I was barely aware of their work. And it was only later. Um, when I was working uh, much more centrally with Natural Theatre Company in the late 70s, that I realised now, looking at Roland's box, that quite a lot of the ideas that we were working with later and round even into the 80s were visual ideas to do with positioning and the use of space. But the other things that I learned, I kind of learned by accident. And one of the ways that we learned, I think, was who invites us to a place, why are we there? And my biggest or first big learning of that kind was in Vienna, when somebody who'd seen um, one of the Bath festivals, the other festival possibly, um, asked us to go to a festival in Vienna to play there. And they'd invited street theatre companies from all over Europe. And the reason they'd done this, they were backed by the School of Architecture in the University of Vienna. And the idea was to look at public space, the use of public space, what happens in public space, and what can be done with it. And there were, as I say, people from all over Europe performing there. But all of the other street theatre companies were performing theatre. They were doing theatrics. They were doing. They had a setup. There was a miniature opera company from Italy. They were terrific. There was a. There were two agit prop companies from different parts of Germany doing political shows in German and one in sort of German and broken English, and they were good too and quite funny. But that wasn't the point. And what it became the point that what we were doing, which were these shows, which moved into the space with this kind of commedia activity. We knew who we were. We had a sense of purpose. Whatever the show was, if it's something like the suitcases piece, we all have a function within that case. It doesn't matter if anybody's watching us. We know what we're doing and we're, we have a goal. We're going to do that. If people see it, that's good. And it always seemed to me that one of the things that would matter is, if, is what this would look like from a distance, what somebody seeing it from the top of a bus might think. Um, whether they'd take that away and create their own narrative to explain what they had seen. So it seemed that that was what the people from the university wanted. They wanted this kind of thing that became part of the moving architecture of open spaces within a city. And they were fascinated by this, so much so that they asked us to come back next year to a similar festival, which would entirely be made up of people from Bath doing these things. So we took an expanded version. Pavel came along with Jackie and their theatre company. British Events formed to do the same thing. We took three companies and we also combined the three companies to do, th do things together. And what we did was cause road accidents and uh, all sorts of things. We got arrested. Um, it was very exciting. We were given permission to do stuff in the street. But I think the things that I began to think about then weren't in terms of entertainment per se with regards to audiences. They were to do with engagement. It was engaging their attention. And it wasn't about keeping their attention by what you did to them. It was by being fascinating in whatever you were doing. And it was having that sense of purpose. We are doing this. A few years later, we were invited to a festival in, ooh, somewhere in southern France, Finisterre, somewhere like that. It was a festival of storytelling. And they said they wanted us to go along. They'd seen us doing this stuff in 
I think in Paris. But what they liked about that was that at this festival of storytelling, the work we were doing, at least some of it, wasn't narrative, but it hinted at narrative. People watched it and sort of went, what are they doing? And made up their narratives. And this seems to me that a kind of street theatre can always be itself in public space. It doesn't need to be seen. It has a sense of purpose. It is doing what it is doing. It is a liquid sculpture. It's whatever it is. Um, but its presence is very strong. And I think that comes out of the strength of the working group. And that's a kind of commedia thing. People working together. That seems to me the strength of this and how you take this forward in a way. Um, who pays for this? That's difficult. <laughs> well, well, I can't follow that. That's very articulate. Yes, wonderful. Um, yeah. Uh, thinking about radical, what was radical then and what's radical now? Well, just what's radical... I think well, what's radical then is really important mm. and then let's look at it later and see what actually... what was the influence and how radical is now because I don't necessarily think it's not radical now. I think the mm. context of what is radical is different. Well, I th yeah, it seems to me it is all about context, actually, where you're doing it and who you're doing it for, because uh, if you're doing it in a little shopping centre in Basildon on a Tuesday afternoon, it's quite different than doing it in the middle of Bath Arts Festival or whatever, or Shambhala or wherever. It's a very different context. So what's radical in one place isn't necessarily radical in another, perhaps. I take what you say about doing nothing um, or doing very little or doing something very simple so it's kind of almost meaningless but actually it has a meaning because you keep doing it um, and I think that's radical in a way to just do something extraordinary and keep doing it um, you know just whether anybody's watching you or not I think that's I mean, there's a kind of radicalism there I suppose I don't know quite what was radical then, really. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think I think just the fact of, of doing it and, and going out and disrupting and transforming it, the thing about transforming the space and transporting the audience. So you go into a space and you change the dynamic yeah. in whatever way, even if you're just chalking a line down the street, which Roland well, Miller did for a long time. Just take a piece of chalk for a walk. Um, and that was enough for, for, to stop people and go, what are you doing? And I think maybe there's a, there's a sort of radical thing in doing extraordinary things so that people ask questions of themselves and of you. And that sort of questioning, setting up questions about what's, what's going on. Can I just have a word yeah. before and I hand it back to you? Um, I mean, one of the things <coughs> that, when I started in theatre, when I was drama school, one actually when I was at drama school, I was a member of the International Socialists, now the Socialist Workers' Party. And I imagine that all work that you had to do had to be quite explicitly political. Um, I mean, most of my life was involved with politics, it still is. Um, but um, the amount of political theatre and even community theatre was a side, was something different. It wasn't, I mean, the, the broad area that we're talking about um, wouldn't necessarily be called political theatre. There were things like cast, agitprop. Um, who, who did um, who did issue based work? Um, a lot of the radical performance uh, that we're talking about now was not. I mean, obviously it came of the time, but it wasn't it, it wasn't issue based. Um, and indeed, even community theatre was certainly. I know when we started, we were some sort of being funded in seventy three. And quite early on, we did uh, residencies and we worked with students and. We enlarged our cast with members of the community, and the Arts Council wouldn't consider that as part of our funded output. If we had to do three shows a year, one of them couldn't be when we're working with the community, which of course, that overturned over the years, and now the funding is dependent on mm -hmm. um, outreach, community. You know, so that, 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 was, that was quite different. So um, where you worked, who you worked for, who you worked with, evolved over over that, that period. But just before I hand back to John, just a general question. Um, 
uh, that uh, I was asked to ask. Um, when we go, when you went on tour at this sort of period in the 70s, when you went to, to Holland or wherever you went, how, what was your experience of the work that was being produced over there? Was it similar to the work produced here? Um, was it, how, how did it differ? How, 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 did, how did you place your work in, in terms of the work that was happening in other festivals. Certainly other festivals were funded more. I mean, we could go to Holland and be the cheapest company there and we'd still get twice as much as we'd get here <laughs> and the dims and accommodation. So clearly there was better funding even in the early 70s. But just tell me, how, how did you, um, how, how was your experience of um, uh, other companies, other countries work? Must have been about 1971 into 1972, the early days of the Natural Theatre Company, and I had the task of trying to arrange a tour. We were doing St George and the Dragon, the classic Mummer's Tale, except you know, in a very particular way. And I can remember getting in contact with Cardiff City Council and uh, having this conversation because well, I wanted to get a street license, and uh, the guy at the other end was interested, got more interested, got very sympathetic and was about to say, oh well, yeah, I think we can do that, Mr. Thomas, when he suddenly realised that it was the natural theatre company and not the national theatre company <laughs> that I was trying to get a licence for. He said, oh no, 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 we can't have that. So we decided, sorry, so we went ahead and did it anyway. But I always think that's terribly ironic because then decades later, the, the Cardiff City Council staged a huge annual street theatre festival, so it came the whole hog. But, yeah, one of the things that was radical about it at the time was because basically there was little of it about, and certainly in terms of the authorities and the funding bodies, it wasn't even recognised. When we went to Holland then, subsequently to Delantown Arts Centre and stuff, I never saw any other theatre because we were there for a residency for a month doing a whole lot of activities in community arts and all sorts of stuff. But I wasn't aware of any other continental theatre companies operating in that way there. There must have been, but we simply didn't see them. So that sort of exchange sort of thing wasn't happening then. It happened much, much later. And what I was saying earlier on about, uh, you know, we were doing this bec because it was about taking theatre out, away from theatres and doing it in the streets and stuff. And what's really interesting now is that having seven years ago retired as a Officer for the Arts Council of Wales is that ten years or so ago the new national then National Theatre Company of Wales was formed, and John McGrath decided that uh, he wasn't going to have a theatre or a theatre base other than an office, and they do their stuff in various situations all over Wales. Their their latest one was Tide Whisperer, which was done on the beaches off Tenby. It was all about the the migrant crisis and people crossing. The, uh, the Mediterranean, and the audience were actually taken in boats with Bluetooth earphones out into the water, and this whole thing of migrants coming in, being washed up, and police launches going out and stopping them happened all around you, and so that was quite an immersive, that, that was pretty radical really. So in a sense, part of that whole thing has become perhaps even more radical than we were doing at the time, uh, but in a different sort of context really. <laughs> there, is, there is an interesting thing about the, the, the work that's done abroad, though, isn't there? That, that they, they tend to, I suppose it's down to what the definition of street theatre is per se, um, they tend to do actual shows or, if you like, theatre pieces, but without the walls of the theatre around them. So you could do, it's like doing a theatre piece but doing it outdoors, as opposed to the sort of street theatre that we were doing, which was more peripatetic and more, um, more incidental. If you like, it didn't. It didn't have. It wasn't set to a script for a start. It was. It was totally improvised. The whole thing, and you played off the moment, and you played off what was happening for, in terms of what the audience was giving you. So well, the sort of street theatre that we were doing, I think, was to do with. It was a three-part theatre. It was to do with your performance, and the audience's reaction to it, and then a third part of the audience's reaction to the audience's reaction, which was, and that's where the theatre really lay is in the, the, the third member of the audience seeing the audience's reaction, particularly, for example, when we were doing protest. 
I mean, the protest was an extraordinary piece to do, and, and quite radical, I think. It was, and it was a, a silent piece that would act really, really make people very angry, in, often. Why aren't you smiling? You know, we were, we were the British Society of Pessimists. Why aren't you smiling? And they would, they would start to harangue us. And, and in one place, we were actually attacked. But what was interesting was not what we were doing, but for, from the audience's point of view, but for the audience seeing members of themselves reacting to our performance. I think that was quite radical. Yeah, I, I, I also wonder how um, taking up the Commedia dell'arte kind of um, and improvisation, working from you know fixed situations with with a scandal being at right at the centre of what you did, and there's something about the way that Commedia allowed. Uh, for improvisation to take place quite quite, quite easily, um, and I, th I I also think about the way that taking that idea of coming from the art schools first of all uh, of the, the, this one particular set of traditions, the the, the degree to which um, and I don't know if you remember this, but we did Limburg Festival together, mm -hmm. and we were allowed a castle and we were allowed whatever we wanted to make a show and quite easily uh, a group of English performers got together a, a very fine show in a very short time. Um, I also did it with a group called Magnificent Seven in the Freiburg Festival where they would just kind of throw the tent open to us every night and we'd have to do a new show of three hours each and they couldn't understand what we're up to because we would argue all day long before the show, be battling for blood, blood on the floor and then we'd produce a new show every night and that sense of improvising something new always was something particularly English at that particular time. And also, I'm wondering, uh, no, not totally English, but you know, there are obviously continental groups that were working in that particular way as well. But there's something about the, and I've been in education, been teaching street arts, etc., at universities, but there's something about the nature of uh, an educational system which is quite structured on the continent in relation to, you, do, you, you are an expert in a particular art form. And you don't you don't improvise. You, you you come from somewhere, and the system that we may operate in this country is a lot opener from the, from from education. You can explore. You you don't even have to be trained to be a performer, of course. And many things happen because we've got this very diverse uh, group of people coming into performance and exploring it and allowed to try things. Mm. And I think that's kind of. I think that also makes for a quite radical theatre because it brings something from outside the canon. You are allowed to play and, 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 and do things that you weren't even trained to do. And that, I think that's something really exciting in that tradition. Are you about to say something? No, no, no. Okay. no. Anybody else? Can, can, can we open it to the floor always about other yeah. ideas? Please. Please. Yeah. Just um, a little side effect or maybe a side effect almost in as far as a when we went abroad for the first time to De Lontar in, in uh, Rotterdam, uh, that's the first place we ever saw the Natural Theatre of Bath. They were on at the same gig. Some guy called, um, oh, I can't remember his name, a, a Dutch person rang Hillary and myself up and said, are you doing anything uh, spacey at the moment? And we said, yes. He said, we're having the science fiction festival. Will you come to De Lontar? And and also Dan, we said, yes, we will. We were lying, of course. And we had like five days to make a show. When we arrived there, I won't go into all that, but we got a show together. And we saw that the Natural Theatre of Bath, who we'd never heard of, were in the same theatre later in the same evening. And we looked into their um, dressing room and we said, we're from London. And they said, fuck off out. <laughs> and um, um, that was jovial, I, I hasten to add. And um, but. Uh, what I, the point I wanted to make was not so much as um, anecdotes from on the road, so much as you, you went to Europe and there you met uh, people from the UK doing work that was not a million miles from what you were doing. I mean, quite stylistically distinct, obviously, but it was there that, speaking for myself perhaps, you, you realise that from all over the UK, and indeed often from art schools, stuff was going on and there wasn't, because there was no internet, you didn't really know. It was very pleasing, you recognised, and I must say that they were rarely uh, European themselves. Um, one saw a modest amount of work, but then you came away and there was a sort of boost because you realised that you weren't um, some uh, 
some strange freak so much as part of a, an emergent community with radical aspirations, certainly in relation to um, theatre as it was constituted then. Mm. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. it was, uh, I, think it, I think it is absolutely the case, and I think it's why uh, the reason is, is, as John puts it, um, the thing that was joyous to me uh, about joining the Natural Theatre Company was that it was non-theatrical. There were, I think I was one of two actors in that company when I joined it. Everybody else came from uh, different backgrounds. Tom was a sculptor um, and he worked regularly with them. Other people were art school backgrounds. Uh, Ralph was a theatre designer. All of them designers. And what came first was the impact of the thing, whatever the thing was, it didn't matter. There were all sorts of different pieces, very, very different pieces, with different kinds of impetus and ways of working. But the first thing about all of them, I'm pretty sure, was what will people see for the first time? It was that kind of impact. And when we went to Europe, the other people we met, as you say, were in fact all <laughs> from England. The people in Germany sort of had, and, uh, had kind of, they were still doing edge crop, I think, weren't they? That's kind of what it felt like to me anyway. Mm. And also, we were, the ch we were cheap. I was told the reason there were so we many good companies that we were they cheap. They fed us so yeah. well. <laughs> to keep us alive, I think. <laughs> yeah, so um, the other thing I was going to say to move on in terms of radicalism, I think the kind of theatre that, that I'm talking about that we were doing at the time, as Pavel says, was quite peripatetic. We moved around quite a lot. We did have set pieces. We had ones that needed a circle and drew an audience and where we made a point about nuclear war, one of them, um, and so on. Uh, very funny, very comedic. And, uh, and they worked. Some of the huge pieces we did in Vienna were set pieces in front of uh, the Karlskirche and uh, where we fell in a pond at the end. Um, and they all worked as well. But the thing that was most exciting and most political, I think, in its way, and still is, and more so now, is that what we were doing in public space was what we wanted to do. And we were doing it in our way, and nobody could stop us. Um, we have occasionally been approached by men with guns, policemen, to try and stop us. And as long as we've had an audience, those people have been laughed out of, out of that space. In Italy, in Germany, in Moscow. Those people have been laughed out of the space by the audience. And the reason for that is because we are doing this thing with our sense of purpose. And it seems to me most important now, um, in this day and age, here and now, more and more of our cities are being privatised. Southgate in Bath is privately owned. The city sort of town centre of Basildon is privately owned. These, these belong to hedge funds. The, you know, the profits they make go to the Cayman Islands. They don't even pay tax here. And you do anything there and people will try and stop you. But if you're doing what you're doing with the kind of commedia elan and the improvisation and the solidity, which is the kind of thing I think we were picking up as our modus operandi at the time, I think if you're doing that, you stand a good chance of not being stopped. And not only not being stopped, not being stoppable. And I think this is the essential politics of street theatre. So in, in, um, in Bath in 71, um, I was busking and stopped every week by the police mm. and told, no, I can't do it until one week I decided I wasn't going to move and then I was arrested and done for obstruction and, uh, and I took my case to court and really had a wonderful time with the <laughs> judge and then paid more than 10 p's for the 30 pounds case discharged. And it was actually the scariest thing I'd done f to be arrested and the consequences of it. And I don't think I'd do that now. That's the loss of my kind of radical impulse in a sense. I'd feel more worried by it, but it was also really important at that particular time uh, the, the, to, 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 to push that boundary formally. Yeah. 
Um, so um, I would just, in terms of the radical, there, there is the radical of the theme of what you're doing, that you're actually, you're suggesting another world. There's radical in the terms of the art form, that you're actually changing the nature of what you're doing. And then the last one, which I just kind of referred to, is the radical in yourself. The ability to actually change, not only as a performer, and to take that on in your life and to inform it in what you do with other people, but also whether the audience, come back to that question of the audience, is the audience radicalised by street theatre? There's a writer called Susan Heidegger that has written about your company, mm -hmm. who says that the actual act of watching an audience, uh, watching a performance in the street, because it's a disruption from everyday life, makes the audience realise that change is possible. Mm. That change is possible. And, and, and in the sense of change being possible, it's not a civil disobedience, it's a social disobedience. Mm. And that you're mixing with people of the same ilk that also are thinking about the change. And that that has uh, an impulse towards a kind of active citizenship. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts about that as an idea. I just want, I'm sorry, I've talked quite a little bit. I just wanted to add on the thing that, <clears throat> mustn't forget, we were all very self depreciatory in as much that we were, in a sense, laughing at ourselves doing this. And that came across quite strongly to audiences. So when you get a situation where suddenly the pompous figures in the authority come along and say, you can't do that here. Because we, whatever we were doing, particularly Natural Theatre Company, who are continual Mickey takers of themselves, in a sense, that deflated the situation and the audience realised that these people were making fools of themselves. And I really wish that today's politicians would actually take that on board and not be so bloody serious about what they're trying to do because everyone's laughing at them, but they don't actually see the joke themselves. It is interesting, I think, that the, the way that the work that we've done now has changed so much and has become safer, if you will. I think the last most radical thing, Rick will remember this, but that we did was probably in Dublin when we were over there and we were uh, given a dressing room at one of the uh, major theatres in the city um, and downstairs in the main house was a play about H-Block. Um, and uh, we were rather stunned by the fact that they had so somewhat sanitised the whole process that was happening in H Block at the time. And we noticed that the audiences were mostly made up of, of jewellery rattlers in their fur coats. So on the spur of the moment, I think, we put together a, a performance where we daubed ourselves in lots of uh, very nasty brown makeup and completely naked. We were just wrapped in, in horrible old blankets that we managed to find and we lined up in the street opposite the front door of the theatre as the audience was coming out. It was the H block and protest. Yeah. We, we did it. We did the H block protest and uh, the, the shock on the audience emerging from the, the rather sanitised play that they'd seen about the same problem was um, palpable and uh, we were arrested. <laughs> well, maybe that was because uh, the play was um, uh, about two Russian people who were s s in a mental hospital, one for political reasons and one because he had an orchestra in his head and the orchestra was on stage, Andrew Previn, you know, and it was incredibly poignant, you know, because the audience, you know, watching the play, which was just two people with blankets, suddenly walking out and thinking, oh my God, you mm. know, what are these people doing, yeah. With, uh, Reminding them of the problem on their doorstep. Uh, well, that's right, yeah. And for me, with a family of very Republican IRA people, um, it was very, very poignant, yeah. Can I say, it was Tom's idea that we do that. No, no, it wasn't my idea. I think it, was, I think it, it was, was uh, I think it was Brian. The, the, the play downstairs was Tom Stoppard's Every Good Boy Deserves yeah. Favour and concerns <laughs> the Russian way of dealing with dissidents, which was to decide they were mental and lock them up. And the audience was, as Pavel says, very upper Dublin middle class. And they were congratulating themselves on living in a free state where that sort of thing could never happen, when 60 miles up the road the H-block protests were taking place. And that's why we did what we did. And, uh, yeah, we did get banged up against the wall with guns up our noses. And then we said, no, no, we're a street theatre company. We're part of the festival. And they sort of backed off with disgust. I don't think you got invited back, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did year. get invited oh, back. Oh, did you? Oh, right. Yeah, two more years. Right. Mm.
Moving along. <laughs> um, mainstream. How has it moved into the mainstream? I think what Roland was saying, and I think it's true, and I go to an awful, I live in London, see an awful lot of work all around the place, um, indoor, outdoor. I think indoor theatre or commissions by festivals has become more radical. Um, in the old days, if you went to the National Theatre anywhere, or any mainstream theatre, um, it would mainly be people, most of the ideas would be communicated um, verbally, people would stand quite still on the stage, not even choreographed, and all the ideas would be sometimes clever ideas, but they would all be communicated um, verbally. Over the years, this has changed. Um, much more visual, much more visual work, as you were saying. You know, the, the, the what is considered an outreach to do to do work in non-theatrical venues now is commonplace. It's very difficult to see anything interesting in theatre because everybody's doing it in non-theatrical venues. Site-specific work is done absolutely everywhere. I know we, when we in the early eighties we did a show at Kew Gardens on the destruction of the, uh, of the rainforest. Um, it was enormously popular because. I mean, I think it was a good show. I think it was a very, very good show. But I think the people, what, the, the audience would flock to it because they wanted to see Kew Gardens out of hours. <laughs> and a lot of mm, venues mm. that um, we've performed at have done fabulous shows. But really, people wanted to see these familiar places out of hours, animated by arts and music, etc. Et, et, et but um, I mean, I remember theatre publicity. Do you, you know them? They, I mean, they were Lecoq trained. They were. Um, in London, they'd all be the other side of the river. Um, uh, and then they were doing, I think, this is right, may not be completely right, but um, I think they were doing um, Winter's Tale, something like this, which was on the uh, curriculum, A-level curriculum. And they were doing it in the Lecoq style, you know, 101 things to do with the chair and things. And, <laughs> They, that was very well reviewed, and then they did the visit at the National Theatre during that visit. And people who went there had never ever seen anything like this. So the reviews were as if they had invented a whole style, while in fact, you know, I mean, they were, I mean, they are an original company, not to underestimate that at all, but lots of people were doing similar work. So as soon as this the, the, the mainstream saw that there were other ways of doing it. I mean, I go to the West End and the National now and I'm astonished. Mm. Circus arts, visual stuff, video, all mixed in, um, that would, wouldn't have been, would have been in the experimental uh, area, you know, even sort of 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think that's, that's, what, that's where it's going now. And, um, you know, I mean, I think what, what was un um, uh, unfunny and pointless as being radical before is annoying now. If you see something unfunny and pointless in the street, one tends to get annoyed, not, uh, not fascinated. Um, so I think the nature of radicalism has, has changed somewhat. Um, um, I'll put a full stop there and hand over to John. So some of the companies that I've seen in, on the continent working there, like Ad Hoc Company, for example, that during the day are all, all older people wandering around the streets as if they've just moved out of the old people's home and in the evening they're doing the same people doing cabaret show as pensioners naked mm -hmm. that's quite radical yeah if you're sitting in the audience you go oh hang on i have to rethink a lot of stuff here watching kamchatka which is another great company that basically working uh working basically in troops of apparently um immigrants walking through the streets doing a very simple thing with a case, opening the case, taking out a photograph, looking at you, looking at the photograph, thinking you're the one they're looking for, and then realising you're not, and then walking on. Simplest act in the world. Mm. Unbelievably moving. So I think that there is very strong theatre going on. I think keep it in the street. Keep it in the street, absolutely. You know that that's that's the foundation. It's the total sorry, statement. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I I just think of, we started in the street. Keep it in the street. Keep on going out into the street. That's that's where this very particular thing can go on and still has a. I agree there may be annoyances, but that's worth examining, isn't it? Why why have I changed that I can't tolerate this anymore? You know. Um, it, it's just, I, th I still think it's so fruitful. 
all on the tube, all in the station, uh, all these numerous places, especially down at Southgate, they could do with a lot more interesting things going on down there. Um, I think it's the source of the strength, is, is the kind of existential possibility of all this space, and what can one do that's engaging in it. The, uh, uh, one thing now is that, um, you know, back in the 80s, people squatted and, you know, people yeah. had cheap housing. Now, everybody has to work, mm. you know, and just to pay, you know, to, to pay the rent, you know. So the idea of, oh, I'll, I'll, spend, uh, I'll spend the summer going around doing the festival, you know, just doing street theatre, you know, it's much harder, you know. I but mean, you know, the grants have got like this and... It's yeah. true, but you don't have to do the festival. No, 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 but you yeah. can do it. But even, you know, spending the, you know, your time, you know, weekends or whatever, you know, it's, it's kind of more difficult than it was, you know. I mean, I did some work with John uh, uh, many years ago, and um, one of the, his, his ideas was to train people up to get a character so that they could busk and earn money, you know. And it was a great idea. And it gave people a lot of a vehicle to become performers, you know, who weren't performing, didn't come back, from, you know, didn't come from an art school or, or theatrical background, you know, and it was, it was a nice thing, you know, uh, it kind of turned into circus media now, isn't it, John in Bristol, you know, so, um, yeah. Keep it on the streets, yeah, good. Let's go out there now. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was interested in asking uh, the people amongst us who are uh, to actually teachers who have been teaching young people uh, uh, about street theatre because of the fact even that there are courses you can do in street theatre seems sort of slightly odd in a way. Uh, but I was just wondering what, where, what the young people are, why they're coming into it. Are they happy to be coming into it through an educational way? Uh, does that mean that they're losing the spontaneity and the, you know, sort of uh, sheer vivacity of just getting up and doing it and, um, and where that's sort of leading? And also the fact that there are more and more people coming out through these courses, where are they going and what, what are they... I don't really want to get on to the future of street theatre because I don't think that's what we're talking about here, but I'm quite interested in uh, what, what the, the educators here think um, about the current state of you know, uh, young people entering the, the, um, profession. Uh, the profession. That's the word, yeah. <laughs> well, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that natural theatre now got a natural theatre school and they're actually teaching uh, the, 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 the technique, if you will, of natural theatre. But people who are going aren't necessarily going to it thinking that they're going to have a career as street theatre performers. They're doing it as um, a thing that um, might enable them to communicate better at work or to communicate better at home. As simple as that. They're using it as uh, a tool for a psychological tool rather than uh, a theatre learning skills school. Well, th this is a good question for both of us because we've had some disagreement about this. Um, have we? No, we haven't. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. I, I, I took street arts into a university and did a street arts degree for seven years, which was very successful, but absolutely at the end I thought, no, I don't want to continue, partly because £9,000 to study street arts is completely criminal. Um, um, and uh, but in that time to answer your question in relation to those students they have gone out and become professionals they have gone out and made, made a living not everybody many of them have done what you've said which is actually take the ability to have confidence the ability to adapt the ability to do all these different things there's always a danger with that of course that it then becomes a sort of a, it's great for well-being or it's great for something or it's great for something it's sort of there's a danger that you can sometimes do this sort of stuff to crack up the social ills of our society in a way that's not acceptable. That actually a more radical, a radical use of those tools would be much better. Yeah. Um, secondly, training is different from education in the sense that I've, we also work in areas of, again, the same dangers in areas of high social deprivation in certain parts of South West. And again, that's a fantastic a, a, a fantastic set of skills, not necessarily that they enter street arts, although some of them have, but that they again develop all the range of skills. So 
simple things like you teach things like aerials and they've gone on to become tree surgeons <laughs> which is a strange thing but absolutely perfect in terms of confidence ability strength body strength etc etc so there are direct connections but there is also something very nice about teaching outdoor arts as a subject in a, in a evening class social club situation that isn't about gaming or something else that's kind of reductive in terms of their strength, their bodies, their opinions, their, the way they see the world. So I I'm absolutely support that, the training. Uh, and I don't think it necessarily lives in universities. It can do, but I think it lives at a postgraduate level where it's research or something. Yeah. But I'll pass it over to John, who's had a disagreement about this. <laughs> I can't remember what the disagreement was about, actually. Well, it was, we'll talk about it then. Well, it was very lovely, because in, in his show, he, he in, his, in your show, you quote the, the, the problems of people going off and studying it at university in a very satirical way, which I love. Oh, about. yes, right, yes, that's in the slapstick show. Um, yeah, uh, see, I don't think you can teach street theatre. I don't you can't think teach theatre? You can't teach, no, I think it's like Fats Waller said about jazz, I think it's Fats Waller, you, you don't learn it, you catch it. You know, it's like a disease, it's like a contagious sort of thing that you, you get or you don't. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, I think it's really hard for young people these days. But we were talking about this earlier on, about in the 70s, I, I saw a, a, um, statistics about this. In the 70s, between 7 and 10% of your income went on rent. Mm. Uh, not more than 10%. Now, it's 50, 60% of your income you need to pay the rent. So I think that, you know, that freedom that was there that we had from, from monetary constraints and we had social security, you could sign on, you could do that, you didn't need a lot of money. Now, even if you're a two person, you're both earning double income, you, you know, and you've got a mortgage, you, you, have, you both have to work, you have to work a lot harder these days. I also think that for young people, and I'm at an age now when almost everybody is young, um, funny I would say that to the Arts Council they say are oh, you working with young people and I say well of course everybody's you know, <laughs> younger than me these days you know, what the hell yeah um, it's a very confusing kind of um, context uh, in politics and all the rest of it I think it was all the um, what we were dealing with was a lot simpler in the 70s and 80s there was you know pre-Margaret Thatcher then there was Thatcher and it was very obvious kind of target and what you would you know, you were either for or against, and you had the miners' strike, you had all these kind of things. Now, there's, there's a, a dearth of stuff, you know, because people have the internet, so there's hundreds of things for people to think about. Um, what are you going to do a show about? And I think there's too much going on, in a way, and it's all little bite-sized chunks. And, and a lot of the street theatre I see now um, isn't about anything. Or if it is about something, they do it in this terribly sort of preachy, proselytising way, and it's just awful. Um, and also, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of street theatre now, or outdoor arts, they do it fourth wall. They, they do it as if the audience isn't there. And I just find that completely um, terrifying or awful, or whatever the word is, that there's no contact with the audience. This eye contact thing, this sort of un understanding your audience is, is, is just not there. And I don't know how you teach that. I don't know how you, you get that across. But, I, but partly it's... I don't think younger emerging artists, as they're called now, have the time to experiment in that way. And when I'm teaching a, a master class next week in Bridport, and going, oh God, what are we going to teach a master class about street theatre? All we're going to do is just go, okay, we've got five minutes, think of something, let's go out and do something. And we're just going to take people out and do stuff in Bridport. I don't know what Bridport's like, but we're just going to go out and do stuff. And I remember when, when we started doing Things. We could go anywhere, this thing of being peripatetic. We used to run everywhere. We used to, do, me and Richie, man, it was just the two of us, um, used to run around just to get to different places. And, you know, we'd make a fuss here and then we'd disappear and be somewhere else and hide, you know, and then pop out again. Um, and we were allowed to go anywhere. It was just, yeah, go out on the street and, and perform. It wasn't like you were at two o'clock here, three o'clock there, and you can perform here, but you can't perform there. It was just like, people go out there. And do a show when you got yeah. let them, you know. Yeah. So they're already waiting. So I, I, I don't know about training. Uh, training is one thing. I mean, a lot of people are coming out of circus schools now where they're learning a lot of skills. And then 
they're trying to make something theatrical out of it, which is a horrendous like, that we've all been there trying to make circus theatrical or vice versa. Um, no, not so much vice versa. But, you know, training is one thing, and then what do you do with those skills? And of course now it's, it's a market, it's a career, it's, it looks like a career path. Oh, going to street arts and outdoor arts. That's a career path for some young people. It was never a career path for me. I had no idea I'd still be doing the same stuff 40 years later. Okay. God help me. Uh, answer that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just, a quick, just a very quick one. Yeah, I agree that, that there is... The, the, the great thing about training is it's short and it's, it's particularised and it produces uh, young people to be in the eyes of the trainer. You, you get that style of training. What something happens in education now is the fact that outdoor arts itself has transformed itself for better or for worse into being able to be uh, combined with all sorts of other non-arts activities forestry commission i don't know what it might be though the, the quantox areas beauty or there, there's all these extraordinary places for producing that skill with agendas with other people now whether that's good or bad i'm not going to pass judgment on it but that actually is where and education and training can go beyond a particular style into looking at the whole structure of the way that outdoor arts can be delivered and very effectively with all sorts of extraordinary outcomes. I think Activate, for example, in Dorset do a really interesting job in relation to pulling across all sorts of different ideas, um, working with uh, all sorts of different agencies. And I think that's, that's potentially quite radical, although constrained by the agendas of the organisations that are working with them. Can I, can I just add to that? Sorry, sorry because sorry. Sorry, we did, um, at a certain point, we decided we weren't making enough money. We earned, we did lots of gigs in the summer. <laughs> and we did lots of gigs in the summer, uh, you know, we got paid per gig. And so some weeks you'd earn 500 quid, sometimes a fiver. Uh, and that became unsustainable. We wanted to keep going. So how are we going to do that? Uh, we, we, at some meeting somewhere, I can't remember, I, was, I think it was in Winchester, we said, we want to, are there, is there anybody here in the audience who wants to work with us? Uh, we'll help you produce something. And somebody came from Shropshire County Council and said, yes, I want to do a project about the River Severn. That turned into three years' work, and sometimes we were getting paid 200 quid a day to go on site visits, which was just unheard of. Um, but what that did was give us a, a path into working with different partners and saying, well, we can work with you to work with communities or deliver your agenda uh, about you know, getting more people in the landscape or whatever it was, or getting people down to the river or all that, all that kind of stuff. And so suddenly we were in this other kind of world of fulfilling people's agendas, um, but still having a bit of a radical edge, I hope, in our performance and the way we approach things. So, so our approach was radical for them, and for us it was quite a mercenary means of just making a living and sustaining a living. And since we've done, since we did that in two thousand and four or something, we did three years of that, and we did Y Valley and Battle for the Winds and for the for the Olympics and various other projects in three years here in Bath with um, um, doing arts in the communities and stuff. And, that, and that's really helped sustain us as a company. <clears throat> you know, we don't rely on, we're not, never, we've never been regularly funded. We've always had project funding <clears throat> and earned income. And it did change completely the way that we worked. We weren't then doing street theatre festivals like we used to do a lot in the summer. So, <clears throat> I don't think that's taken the radical edge off of us because I think the places that we've been working in, it's quite radical just to go there and do something. But like we're working at the Y Valley, it's got our fourth Y Valley River Festival coming up, and that's a community or communities that don't have much access to to radical work. You know, we, we've done quite some quite extraordinary things up there, or taken other companies up there. And people have never seen stuff like that before. So to them, it's quite new and radical. To us, it's not. But to them, it is. Um, so it's all about context. Yeah. Just to add to that, I, I was involved You've got to with give you. give it back or... to your chair in a minute. What? Sorry? You have to give it back to your chair in a minute. I'm yeah. terribly sorry, chair. Do you want it now? No, you have it now. All right. I was just going to um, sort of agree 
with uh, with John because uh, I was involved in the seven part of that project. Mm. What I thought was really good about it was that the street theatre we were doing was new to me, different kind of street theatre, different performative elements, more music. It was uh, terrific. It was a learning curve for me, but it also went to places where they'd had no street theatre whatsoever. It went to places after very bad flooding and it cheered them up enormously. I mean, it was they were in a hell of a state up to them in those places. They were still ringing out their smalls, you know. It was uh, they were miserable. The place stank, and we uh, we amused them enormously. But also, it was uh, it introduced all kinds of other elements. And I think for you, it was a radicalising thing too. Mm. It was um, you needed it to make the money. Desperate men needed it to be, become more of a player in that kind of world. Um, and I think that's a good lesson, probably for all of us working in street theatre, to find out what other people's agenda is it more than one agenda? Uh, whatever their agendas are, you know, it goes back to what I was saying about sort of way back in 1979, when people asked us to go because they were interested in the architecture of public space, finding people who need what street theatre can still offer. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a thing. Um, in terms of teaching, uh, what I've mainly done for the Natural Theatre Company and uh, for whatever they're called in Aberyst with the uh, thingy for uh, yeah. performance arts, the doesn't matter, yeah. University of Wales. Um, Jackie and I, Brian and I have done these uh, courses there and what we tend to do is take people around the towns where we've done this and uh, on a kind of performative walk, getting a feel for the place and then uh, doing a thing which you inspired me with years ago with the Crystal Theatre of the Saint. You had a show called Ideas Are Animals. Mm. So what we did was uh, look at a place, these people who have never met each other before, we walk around, we talk about the possibilities of street theatre, show them some of the stuff we've done, and then we ask them for ideas about the place that we're in. And from that we choose a couple or three things to actually make happen completely new things out of their own ideas. We discuss them, it becomes a created work from that group of people. We uh, caparison it out of Oxfam shops if we can, um, that sort of thing. So it's very, very cheap. It's everybody's ideas. And the ideas that we can't use because they're too expensive or would take too long to put together they're still alive. Ideas are animals. Mm -hmm. We park those ideas in the zoo of ideas and they're still there for people to use. And I think uh, we can think about conceptual street theatre as well. The, the things that are really good ideas that we can and will use when we have the option to do this. Sorry, I've just got, can I just quick anecdote? Very quick, very quick. Crystal, so crystal Theatre. So, so, so there's a bus route uh, all the way through Bristol, and they they did a thing. Uh, you get on the bus, you, or you you're on the bus, and at the bus stop, one of the bus stops, there'd be a zebra, and the zebra would get on the bus, and then you go a bit further, and a tiger would get on the bus, and then and a porcupine, and then a hyena, and then an elephant, and get on the bus, and then at the last stop, the zookeeper got on, and then the next stop was the zoo, and then you got to go off back to the zoo. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I've generally um, developed into large-scale site-specific theatre, and although it's almost entirely been outdoors, it's always been deemed as not street theatre. I think site-specific mm. theatre is not deemed as that, even though one may occupy a, a, a similar space. Um, I not teach regularly, but I infrequently teach, and. Um, Usually, if I do sessions, I do, I do master classes from time to time, but I, I talk either to undergraduates, but mostly to MAs in performance. Um, I talk a bit about the work that I've done, about what I consider site-specific or outdoor work, and then I set them a brief to come up with ideas of, uh, I give them a number of different locations, it could be a bunker, uh, um, a disused building, a palace, etc., large-scale things. And I say, money is no object, permissions, you've got permissions to do whatever you want, endless budgets, you commission, so it's absolutely, you know, and they, they have a period of time, I invite them to groups to come up with ideas. And 
I'm perpetually amazed at how they, rather than doing something of a large scale, which has been my inclination, they reduce it to something quite intimate. So a palace, for example, that could, or a big building that could be a backdrop to um, uh, vast pictures. They do little corners of rooms, and this is something that I've noticed increasingly. Um, to make that students want to make something manageable and realizable. Mm. And quite often when I talk about ideas, people actually want to know how you get a grant. People are very interested in how to get a job at Disney. Um, so I think that, you know, based on what, what you know, what John was saying uh, about, or other people have said about the need to make money, that I think that has very, very much made anything that you teach people, they want to convert it quite quickly yeah. into something that yeah. will be useful. Not something that or a scale can, they can understand. Yeah, a scale they yeah. can understand and realise. So um, I I did a big parade for the Queen's Jubilee. Um, I had about five six hundred people in it, and they couldn't imagine how I could do it. But so what they wanted to talk about was not the ideas behind it, but how could that be done? And it's you know you just deconstruct it into heads of departments, etc. Like you know I always stay and look at film credits just to see how many departments and how um, but I think there is a much more practical approach to edu you know people studying particularly if they're paying top dollar for it um, uh, I don't know Dave do you want to say something because you're you're um, you're with lots of students at the moment is there anything to add to that well my students are all they're all designers they're theatre designers so they, they're doing performance aren't they they yeah, um, I teach at the University of the Arts London in the Wimbledon College of Art branch. It's a, an umbrella organisation of about six or seven London art colleges, a huge organisation. Uh, and I teach um, young uh, theatre and set and special effects designers for uh, theatre and screen and of course TV. Uh, I'm not a designer but I do contextual stuff. They've just started a brand new performance course literally two weeks ago. They threw out fine arts, made them go to Camberwell, and then they were enlarging the campus inhabited now solely by performance disciplines. And um, they've got two art, they've got two um, performance courses, and one is radical and one isn't. One's called something like Acting for Theatre, and the other's called something like, I can't remember, I don't work on them yet, um, something, something for performance, and the distinction is perfectly clear. And um, uh, they will, um, yeah, there, there will be radical uh, notions of performance uh, emerging in three years' time from that place. Uh, and I don't know what will emerge from the theatre, uh, of course. It may be quite traditional. Just, just a question, because I think we've got a film shortly, haven't we, in a few minutes. Um, to what extent do you think... Um, the internet, social media has made a difference because, I mean, when I used to do these um, wacky and offensive things on the tube, there was nobody to record them and uh, send them worldwide. Um, uh, people are, you know, when, when I do these bits of teaching that I do and I ask people of what theatre they've seen, they, they've seen all these groups, but they haven't, they've seen them on YouTube. And I just wonder to the extent that the uh, accessibility of work uh, via the internet um, has somewhat diminished people's experience of the, uh, you know, of actually being there and um, smelling the sweat. Um, I just wonder if that is, um, you know. Having taught for many years in an art school and at the moment teaching students who actually perform in Second Life, they're actually performing through an avatar and that's been going on for sort of 10 years and I think there's a huge change in the methodology of how people perform. So you've got people performing in their bedroom on YouTube to, to millions of people. Um, and they see that now as a very valid way of exposing themselves to an audience. They can also have an active dialogue through social media, Twitter, Instagram. Your story on Instagram has become hugely populated by people who want to do performance. In fact, their portfolios to get into art school are quite often e-portfolios that are all built on those platforms, which doesn't diminish in any way their interest in performance or the physical or the critical. And we, we tend to talk about the liquid realm and the living studio and try not to diminish that as a, as a 
a method because obviously we've grown up with a much more physical geographical performance element and I was working with Reg Bolton suitcase circuits you know we had stones thrown at us it's a lot safer if you're doing it in second world it's you know the, lot, the worst thing that can happen to you is you're deactivated and then you go like that um, so I think there is two different realms being talked about now and I think there is some really quite radical and quite brilliant performance happening if you like in that liquid realm which shouldn't be forgotten about um, and Derevo for example if people are aware of Derevo, who's a Russian yeah. um, artist, he started to work. He went to Paris and worked with Gollier because he's a physical theatre person. He's 64 now and he realises that maybe being naked is not deeply attractive <laughs> to everybody, even himself anymore. So he's worked with Gollier and he's working with mixed media and he's again working in that liquid realm with the spectacle because he's moving his performance where he thinks he'll get an audience and that's his feeling about mm. it. So I think we need to think about new audiences. That's really fascinating. But just the, the, the thing about the, 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 what the internet and what the use of modern technology is doing in terms of street theatre now is that we're finding that wherever we go, rather than wanting to, to watch or participate, all the public seem to want to do is to film it and film themselves in it. And all they really want to do is to, can I have a selfie with you? That is the, that's what we're hearing everywhere we go now. We can't, we can't actually do the, the performance because we're constantly, all they want to do is go and have a selfie taken. It's all come down to that tiny little screen. In, in as much as the same way with, with actors nowadays, that every, everybody seems to do television acting. Everything is really small and very quiet, mumbled, rather than filling the space. Not the question of filling the space with volume, but filling the space with performance energy. Just to Absolutely more. Just um, uh, yeah. uh, we've got a film coming up, is this right? 2.45? Um, three minutes over. So just before we watch that film, let me, if John will just say... Yeah, no, just one, one response to that. Basically, we've got a generation of young people that have been brought up experiencing art through a screen. Um, that doesn't mean that they want to carry on doing that. I think that what that offers them is the opportunity to have mixed media in relation to their experiences in life. So they're as happy to go off mountain biking as they are to take something off the screen. And actually, one of the things of outdoor arts is to be able to accommodate this, this ability to choose between many things in the future. I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of important. Well, passive involvement. It may, it may not be passive involvement. There may, there may be all sorts of strategies that you can engage with. I think you've got to listen to them, not you. We, we have to listen to them and to the way that they're thinking and doing. There are some very spectacular ideas coming through on, on this level, mixing it up. Okay. Um, we, have a, we have a film now, uh, Walcott Waves the Rules, um, for half an hour, and then we'll sum up um, before, the, uh, before the session finishes. Can we take a group selfie then before we all go? <laughs> <laughs>